you know, this is a Suk Jung Lee um, at the East Asia Institute and also teaching at Sungyunkwan University. Uh, we organize a special webinar um, you know, to reflect on the result of uh, uh, November 8th uh, general election in Myanmar and also to discuss the prospect of democracy in, in this country. Uh, let me briefly uh, report to the participants about the Myanmar election uh, 12 days ago. As we all know, Myanmar suffered uh, nearly 50 years of isolation under the very strict uh, military rule, but the country went ahead for democratic transition from the, uh, the midpoint of uh, 2000s as generals, uh, military generals began to loosen their hold on power facing a very popular democratization demand. The first election was held in uh, 2010. However, as we all know, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, National League for Democracy, NLD, boycotted it. And then NLD participated in the next 2015 election and won with a landslide victory. Uh, and this time, again, NLD won with a huge margin in the bicameral legislative uh, uh, election and, and can remain in power. I checked the uh, website and as of uh, 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 yesterday, um, the NLD secured 396 seats in both uh, uh, the legislature and USDP held only 29 seats and other political parties held uh, 45 seats. So compared, you know, if we look at this result, it's fantastic for uh, NLD to claim such a huge victory. And despite the COVID-19, the Myanmar took a uh, free election, timely and peacefully. So that's, I think, a great achievement. Nevertheless, there has been criticism calling the election as flawed uh, by canceling polls in Lakhine state. So Rohingya minority couldn't vote. Again, this is a big issue. Uh, anyway, this time election was seen as a referendum on Aung San Suu Kyi's government and herself and NLD seemed to maintain great popularity inside uh, Myanmar, uh, even as the Rohingya crisis damaged their international reputations. With this popular mandate, would Aung San Suu Kyi and NLD be able to govern the country more freely with no need to share power with the military? In particular, can they change the constitution to give one third of bicameral seats that are controlled by the military to popular voting? That's a huge issue too. Also, can popular NLD government persuade Myanmar people to allow Rohingya refugees return home safely. And despite this election victory, the prospect for Myanmar's democratic transition uh, does not seem to be bright to many eyes with the strong power of military generals and also very hawkish nationalistic Buddhism. Um, yeah, you know, very exclusive about this uh, Muslim minority. So to discuss these very important issues, uh, we invited four distinguished panelists. Let me introduce them by the alphabetic order of their last name. Our first panelist is Sai Ye Kao Swat Mint, and he is the executive director of People's Alliance for Credible Elections. And Ko Sai was a co-founder and an instructor of politics at the Yangon School of Political Science and also worked as a network officer for the British Council. Thank you for uh, uh, attending this webinar. And our second panelist is a Richard Lover and he's research fellow at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies. And Robert, um, uh, Richard, sorry, Richard is a DPhil candidate and St. Anthony's College uh, of Oxford University. And he is advisor to the model International Criminal Court, Myanmar. 
And our third panelist is Ms. Mo Tuzar. She's a research fellow at ICAS Yusuf Ishak Institute. She's leading the Institute's Myanmar program and also advised Myanmar's ASEAN chairmanship in year 2014. Our last but not least panelist is Mr. Kai Min, Executive Director of the Sandy Governance Institute. He's leading democracy research and social movement activities for transparency and accountability in the public sector of Myanmar. So welcome uh, for distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, okay, so let's start our first round of discussion and each panelist can speak about seven minutes. And here, I'd like to hear your opinion, your assessment of uh, November 8 election result. Uh, do, you, do you have expected this kind of a huge victory for NLD? If so, why? What were the major issues this time at the uh, general election there? And then uh, NLD government, uh, some many people say is becoming quite authoritarian but still they seem to be very popular. Uh, so or some say uh, they have a very rational, pragmatic strategy uh, to just to uh, move democracy gradually uh, in, for the peace. And some people say uh, they are kind of betraying our hope for more, more strong democratization way. So, um, to these uh, set of questions, I'd like to invite Kosai first to, to, to share the, your views. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I mean, the, regarding the result, I, I think that uh, before the elections, uh, the analysts, the observers, even the political party themselves, uh, I mean, Majority of people expect that NLD will win this election again, but no one expect this big. Even I don't think even NLD will expect this big uh, a win. So this is kind of a huge, I think, surprise for everyone. That's that's for clear. But for me, uh, the recently, as you just mentioned, that of this in after the elections in this post-election period, there are a lot of criticism from the the main opposition party, party USGP, led by the other political party, talking about, criticize, criticize about the integrity of the electoral process. So I want to touch a bit on that too, uh, before we move for me touching the other subject. Mm -hmm. We can break it down into two, uh, two phases of ele electoral process, pre-election period and then election period. So during the pre-election period, everybody was concerned about how the elections was going to happen because of COVID-19 and then because of the, the tension between political parties and the, and, the, and the UEC. The relationship between political party and UEC was very tense. So no, also majority of political party were criticized, criticizing about the way UEC managing the electoral process. And everybody was concerning about the COVID-19 situation because we didn't have this capacity in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the preparedness. So everybody was concerned about this thing. At the same time, uh, because of COVID-19, the level playing field was very uneven within the political party. You can see that uh, the, the COVID-19 situation put a huge restriction on the political party and candidate movement to reach out their electorate. And then the UEC could not come up with alternative measures or alternative apparatus or alternative infrastructure for the political party and candidate to reach out their electorate. So it creates a huge and even level playing field between incumbent and the non-incumbent political party and then resourceful and non-resourceful political party. That's for clear. So, so I think that uh, that made the pre-election period very uneven and then very uh, concerned for the, for the post-election period. That's what we are now witnessing about that. So, so I think that in terms of transparency, in terms of level playing free, the, the pre-election period, pre, pre period was very, very 
uh, shortcoming in terms of democratic print server. That's, that's my analysis regarding the pre-election period. But for the election day, we are very fortunate. And then we, I mean, from here, I have to acknowledge uh, the poll workers, the subcommission members, trying to make sure that everybody was safe and then trying to run the election smoothly on election day. So on election day, was very calm and very smooth than we expected. So that, of course, there are some, there were some uh, administrative uh, irregularities, there are some mistakes, but we didn't see systemic fraud trying to change the outcome of the, the whole electoral landscape. So I think that if we break it down into two parts, the pre-election period is very concerned and from, from the democratic perspective, it is very, it, it, yeah, we can see a lot of flaw. But on election day, it was very smooth and I mean like pretty transparent and then pretty, I mean, calm. So, so I think this is, this is what we have uh, right now. So I think that the political party have a legitimate uh, concerns regarding and, the, and then they have a legitimate right to looking at the current result and then the, the electoral process. But for me, the result is credible and then we could accept, we should accept the result. One has come to the whole process, 315 constituency. Definitely, of course, there are some location and some polling station. There are uh, issues about voter lists, issues about uh, the advanced voting. But in terms of the whole process, the result is credible. We should accept that, that's, that's for sure. But for the long run, I think that uh, it's already shown that, it's already proved that the current electoral legal framework doesn't fit the changing political context. That's something we need to do. First, firstly, uh, the way the independent of the, uh, of the election commission, that's something we need to cons uh, review seriously. The secondly, when you look at it, the result, even though NRD won the majority, it doesn't reflect a minority political aspiration. So we also need to look at the electoral system. The current system we are using as PTP, which may not necessarily, I'm not saying that NRD got this majority and it, it, NRD doesn't represent the whole country, but there are some minority that still need to be represented at the parliament. So if we, do, if we need to do so, we need to change the, we need to review the electoral system. I'm not, I don't have the, 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 the answer right now, but something we need to review our current electoral system, whether we should go whether we can find a way for more inclusive uh, uh, electoral system in the, in the future. That do, this two fundamental electoral legal framework and structure of uh, the change we need to be, we need to be prioritized in, in the next five years. And this, on top of this, this structural problem, we also have the, of the, uh, the, the practical issue like, like something like the travel restriction and uneven level playing fee, 90 days voters, so that's also something making the, 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 the disadvantages for the newcomers. You know, if we can make sure the level playing field, if we can make sure that their voice has been heard at their electorate, there might be some changes at some particular constituency. I don't say that the whole electoral landscape will be changed, but definitely there are high profile civil society leaders running in some state. There are high political profile. I, I activists running in some region, but because of this situation, they were never reaching out their electorate. They were never that their, their visibility is 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 compared to the income bank is is really low. So they never had a chance and to do so. So I think that uh, before we whether we should surprise or not surprise, I think that for for me, my first impressions and my first analysis in the regarding the process is something like so. Th this is my first analysis regarding the two thousand. Uh, November 8th uh, election in election. I'm, I'm happy to come back for more, more discussion on this. Thank you. I have a very, sh uh, very short follow-up question to Kosai. So, so it sounds like you are saying, suggesting COVID-19 helped the ruling party uh, to win uh, with more unexpected margin. Uh, do you agree? So COVID-19, because when this kind of pandemic crisis, the voters tend to rally around the government. Does it help the ruling party or not? What I'm trying to say is because of COVID-19, um, 
some other political parties and some other candidates were not able to reach out. So election could should election should have been more con competitive, but because of COVID nineteen, it's less competitive than with it. Because you always you always see that we have political party merging into one in different state, but because of COVID nineteen, they were never reaching out what they being planned. So I think that this that make this advantages for the newcomer and mm -hmm. make less uh, competitive. Mm -hmm. Okay, in that way, help the Luli Party. Okay, uh, <laughs> Lich, uh, Lichard, uh, it's your turn. Right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the East Asia Institute. I'm, I'm very glad to be uh, on a panel with uh, people whose work I respect so highly. Um, of course, that also is always a difficult task, uh, speaking after someone who summarized things uh, so very well. Um, I, I agree with with most of what COSI has, has said, and I'll try and, and, uh, and highlight some, some different areas. Um, and I think starting maybe with the question why it's not so surprising that the NLD has uh, had uh, this kind of victory. And I think that's largely because everyone realizes that the election wasn't really very much about politics, but rather about personality. Uh, and this is a dynamic that very much favors uh, the NLD because uh, Aung San Suu Kyi remains by far the most revered politician in Myanmar and other parties simply do not have the same level of exposure. Uh, and this is sort of um, even strengthened um, by the fact that voters continue to vote for the NLD because of its image as the key adversary to the Tet Medor. Um, and this cleavage between uh, the civilian power and the military continues to define uh, Myanmar rather than, uh, let's say, you know, sort of detailed policy platforms, right? And this is also sort of a question, right? And sort of what is, normally you would ask, what are the defining political uh, elements there for, for an election, right? What, are, what is sort of the discussion all about? Um, but I would, I, would, I would go as far as saying it'd be slightly misplaced to, to highlight actual policy promises or something of that sort as uh, the defining factors for how constituents decided to, to vote. Um, and, and this is an important point because this, this void of, of sort of a focus on content is filled with something else. And it's filled with campaigns that are highly personality based, right? And if you look at sort of a lot of the, the NLD campaigns for, for MPs, for non-senior um, contenders or first-time contenders, the campaigns largely revolve around associate, associating yourself with Aung San Suu Kyi and kind of feeding off uh, that popularity. Um, and so you have these personality-based campaigns and at the same time then you have uh, a large degree of misinformation. I mean this is something that's currently I think a lot of people are sort of focusing on and looking at the misinformation campaigns that have been going on uh, on, on social media in Myanmar and the, and the hate speech that's sort of attacking uh, individual um, candidates. And there's also a, a risk, especially for the NLD with these highly personal, uh, personality-based uh, campaigns, because if people connect to you based mostly on who your party leader is rather than uh, your content, then should the moment come that that leader for whatever reason cannot partake in politics anymore, um, then you're going to have a large problem. And it's actually something that many people within the NLD, especially sort of the more senior ranks of the party, fear very greatly is that uh, should that moment arrive, there will be a party split. Um, and since the NLD has this, this very, you know, strong hold on Myanmar politics with these majorities in both, both uh, um, chambers of parliament, um, you, this would of course have, have grave repercussions also for the political landscape and for the way politics uh, would work in the future. Um, do I still have a couple of minutes? Yeah, okay. Um, let's, yeah, let's talk a little bit about maybe the difference in perception between the 2015 elections and uh, the elections now. Um, and there's a question of, you know, sort of, the waning democratic spirit and, and sort of the elections now are perceived in a more critical fashion, right? Um, and I think the, the key reason for that is that in 2015, Myanmar was to some extent uh, unified by the very high hopes 
that uh, existed for the future. Uh, and many of these hopes like national reconciliation or further retrenchment of, of military influence uh, and greater economic strength um, have, have pretty much been squashed now. Um, in Myanmar today, and I think this is sort of when we're talking about also the aftermath of this, uh, this election, the post-election period, we see a Myanmar that is extremely divided. Now you can say, okay, Myanmar has always been divided uh, along uh, several uh, important lines. But, you know, the, the sort of the violent clashes we have seen between party supporters uh, at rallies, also at, at uh, you know, at, at sort of victory rallies and uh, celebration rallies and campaign rallies before, uh, they, bear, they bear testament um, to, this, to these stronger divisions. And then also you have an increased problems with, problem with the confidence uh, in elections itself. Right, and there's still, I mean, no doubt, there's still the confidence is still very strong comparatively, but that we see moves like the USDP's uh, decision to contest the validity of the election results. I mean, these are the kind of developments that we all know from countries all over the world serve to undermine uh, a population's confidence in, uh, in in elections and in democratic uh, process. And it's been said uh, before the first past the post electoral system um, really does not help because it, it, it consolidates the divides uh, that do exist um, in, in Myanmar today. And it makes it extremely difficult for smaller parties, both ethnic or uh, sort of uh, smaller Burma uh, focused uh, parties to, to gain seat. Uh, and of course, and I think this is, this is sort of something we'll maybe talk a little bit more in the second part. Um, we also have this uh, perception of a waning democratic spirit because of the performance of the NLD, which has plainly adopted some more autocratic uh, governance. But it's important here, and this is, will be my last sentence, to always be aware that there's a different level if, if it's sort of Myanmar observers and researchers and people who work for sort of civil society organizations talking about this who will raise these issues, or whether we're talking about uh, constituents, voters in general, who I think is fair to say today still very much feel that the NLD uh, protects uh, democracy and they wouldn't feel that there's a waning uh, democratic spirit. Thank you, Richard. Now let's turn to Mo. Uh, Mo, uh, both Kosai and Richard have discussed it. Uh, this, now it's time to reform the electoral system in Myanmar. Uh, for example, Richard has mentioned uh, uh, this first past post rule is giving more power to big uh, ruling party. So maybe is there any debate about the introducing proportional uh, portion of uh, electoral divide? Uh, you followed uh, elections of Myanmar a long time, so I'm sure you have many things to say. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. And I'd also like to add my thanks to uh, to Gosai and Richard, who spoke before me, uh, to uh, to express our appreciation to the East Asia Institute for uh, inviting us to share our thoughts about Myanmar's elections and the uh, democratic transition uh, in in the context of that. Um, let me just um, add on to to what Gosai and Richard mentioned about the surprise, not surprise uh, element of the elections. I think it was, it was clear um, to, to all of us that the NLD would receive a second mandate. That was a certainty, but the surprise element, if any, I think was uh, you know, the different views that existed among uh, commentators, analysts, and so on about um, the extent of that returned mandate. And of course, now we, we have seen that it is a resounding mandate. Um, with an overwhelming majority that is uh, even uh, higher than the uh, the previous historic win in 2015. So let me just say here that you know it was it was Myanmar's largest democratic exercise, and and as Gosai mentioned too, it was largely a safe and fair exercise for the over 30 million voters who participated in it. And of course, we also have to acknowledge uh, the different aspects and. Uh, experiences of this uh, this historic vote um, because um, 
the 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 uh, the surprise factor, I think, also was uh, maybe the the voter turnout. Um, that was more for external observers than I think people in Myanmar who were quite certain that there would be a high turnout. And um, both Richard and Gosai have also touched on uh, the disenfranchised voters. Yes, there were people who could not vote at all, and topmost in the international communities, mine would be the Rohingya communities in Myanmar and in the refugee camps, but there were also uh, many people in the several ethnic areas across the country uh, where voting was cancelled for security reasons. So uh, for them, you know, there was no participatory experience and uh, the landslide win would have been more abstract. So what I'm saying is, yes, this is unfortunate, but it, it still does not disqualify the democratic mandate received by the incumbent. So, so this is why I'd like to pick up on what Gosai and Richard were talking about, what lies ahead for the democratic transition about, about you know, further improving and developing the, the democratic institutions um, so that the, the democratic processes in Myanmar will be more inclusive and participatory and, 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 and uh, become a level playing field for all citizens. Um, Definitely, that 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 uh, that is important because you know the exercise of democracy is not just elections. You know, good elections don't necessarily translate into um, democracy all by itself. Although elections are an important part, an important ritual of democracy, and and of course, you know, uh, then you start uh, looking at the kind of binary choices and decisions that people made um, in in 2015, and again, overwhelmingly in 2020. Um, citizens want democracy. And the simple message I think that was very clear at the 2020 vote was, we are voting for NLD because we do not want uh, a larger role of the military uh, in, in the country's political uh, life anymore. So, so basically, this, this, it boiled down to that. And um, I would see that, that, you know, this will be another starting point to, to continue uh, promoting and entrenching uh, the democratic institutions, including that kind of civic ed education on what democracy means, as in, you know, um, making that informed choice. So you asked me about this uh, first past the post um, uh, system that, uh, that uh, uh, Richard also raised uh, in terms of what needs to change in future uh, for the country's uh, democratic transition. Um, there have been discussions in the parliament during the administration of the uh, USDP, of the Union Solidarity Development Party uh, government over 2011 to 2015. There were some uh, discussions mooted in the parliament then on uh, whether the, the uh, the electoral system and this uh, first past the post versus uh, proportional representation, uh, you know, should be considered. And and uh, so I would say that that discussion has started, but I think uh, it's still a work in progress in the sense that there there needs to be I think more more of that informed discussion and debate on uh, what are the pluses and minuses of an FPTP, of, of a first past the post system? What would be the pluses and minuses for proportional representation in a country uh, that is quite diverse, such as Myanmar, and how that would uh, translate into the different um, state and regional level assemblies as well? Of course, in, you know, if, you, if you look at it uh, simply, um, we inherited that first past the post system uh, from the British, and it was written into the 2008 Constitution, which of course uh, then uh, also needs to be uh, reviewed, revisited, and, and that's another, I think, important priority platform that uh, the NLD government has, uh, has committed to since 2015, as well as uh, for the current platform. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, the, the, the arguments for and against are still going on, um, but of course, uh, Myanmar going for a multi-party uh, democratic system, and this was something that was announced when the Burma Socialist Program Party decided to to step down, to step aside, and then uh, introduce democracy or a multi-party, a democracy type of system. So they use multi-party democracy, which means there are more than two parties. Whereas if you see the first past the post system in practice, it would be, uh, say, for example, what we have seen in uh, in the United States. 
So, so again, I, I think there needs to be that kind of crucial conversation that continues on what model fits Myanmar best. And it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other, but something that actually responds to the very unique uh, peculiar circumstances of Myanmar's diverse uh, communities. Thank you, Mo. Uh, I guess uh, three previous uh, panelists have discussed a lot about how uh, you can reform your election law and rules and kind, but to my mind, uh, even before you discuss you know, how many for the first past post the constituency voting and how many portion of uh, proportional voting, that's more secondary uh, than the more primary issue of how we can turn one third of seats under the popular voting. So military cannot designate uh, they are chosen people to one third of bicameral legislature, but it seems like there is no such debate yet. So, so can you share your your thought on this issue too? You need to mute, kind. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Actually, uh, the can you hear me? Yeah, but just speak okay, yeah. a little bit loudly. Uh, yes. Louder, yeah. Okay, yeah. Actually, I I, I agree with uh, Kosain and 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 um, Domoduza. Actually, Kosain pointed out uh, pointed out about the about the integrity of the election pre pre election. So I agree with him. And and uh, actually, this institutional landscape was uh, created for me was created not by NLD, actually by the by the military. So the, the, all of us, no, all the all the political parties, they, they are they are playing no, under under the under the 2008 constitution. So that's I think one one disadvantage for the for the small party, especially for the ethnic minority. So I, definitely the, the the electoral system and UEC, no UEC the institutional chain so so it's it's required so we we have to you know we have to change the element maybe at that but we we need consensus so we need to discuss about the about about these issues you know in the in, in the in the parliament both in, inside and outside outside parliaments but not both formal and informal way i think that I think that that's very important with the, the, the ruling government. They need to create now space for 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 discussing these is, issues not informally and formal, formally at the same time. But uh, but actually here actually I want to discuss about public perception, no? public perception and elite elite percep perception. That's because uh, I travel extensively uh, in, in 2019, 2018, all over the country. So actually NLD uh, victory, we could expect, we could expect it as uh, Kusai man, man mentioned, but we didn't, I did not expect NLD would win that many, that many seats, but I, I, I could expect that it would win. No, it will, especially in the Burma majority, no, Burma, Burma majority regions. So actually, uh, what I want to explain is, NLD victory doesn't depend entirely on Dong San Suu Kyi personality. So I want to point out this fact. Actually, it also depends on 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 the public perception and its performance. So when when I visited you know, rural rural uh, rural areas and and small towns, so I met with people. I usually I discuss and and I ask them, what do you think of? You know, what do you think of and 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 the government? So they are also in everywhere there are there are also issues, but generally they you know, they they actually they like you know, they. Supported, uh, they, they supported NLD because uh, because in terms of infrastructure, so it's it's very obvious that uh, the roads and 
roads you now roads are better than a, a lot better than before so usually that's why i think that so we we need to be aware that ordinary people they you know they they, they support energy because of its you know, budget budget expenditure so usually the the, uh, the public opinion is uh, before you no know, but before 2015 20% of the uh, budget would be you no know, was spent you no know, spent but 80% put into the pocket something like that now 80% 80% of the budget was spent for the for the community development but 20% may be wasted so that kind of opinion pe people have i think that's why uh, they are they they won no? they won this election but we don't we, we don't expect but at the same time at the same time structural factors also we we need to take into account actually before 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 the election several think tanks including international crisis group you know asia asia foundation and my 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 friend christian stokes from oslo university they also yeah actually they have written not written paper articles about uh, electoral system and political parties in myanmar so they pointed out the fact that even the merging of ethnic party will not address uh, address the problem of uh, the, the the national national party winning winning majority seats not seats in in, in the election because you know, because of the structural conditions usually in the in, when when you look at the previous history 1990 2000 2010 2015 usually bigger party national national party they 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 won they won the majority they won the majority but uh, the, the although the the ethnic minority composed of 30 percent of the population uh, population but usually they they won only 15 percent 15 percent of the seats but this time now this time in my opinion they perform better than before now so for example my snld they became it became programmatic party so they embrace all 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 the not all the minority group not within within their within their uh, constituency so they can you know, they, they they could perform well and more unity party also they the, the unity party also they want more seats than before so it's a it's a long term process but the in this election i think the the main problem is a uec so UEC, maybe I have to put a put a blame on UEC. UEC in in pre-election period, UEC was not acting like an independent commission. That's a that's a problem. That's a problem. But you know, as you know, and then also as a as a ruling party in this, maybe they 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 would see it as a game. Now they would see it as a as a game and then the rule of the game was created by the military. So they May, they might have taken advantage of it. Taken uh, taken advantage of it. In my uh, in my opinion, uh, several no? uh, several people actually political party also political party also they were encouraging uh, the ruling government and UEC to postpone uh, to postpone the election because of the COVID nineteen situation. But in, in my opinion, the you know, UEC also didn't postpone. Might be the reason. Might be. They want to gain. They want to gain the legitimacy, no? legitimacy again, strong legitimacy again, to to no? to continue to implement major major reforms, political, social, economic economic reform. That's why. But now, NLD recently, NLD issued a statement, actually telling uh, telling the people, uh, telling the politi ethnic political party that they they are on the same page. Uh, they were they actually the aspiration of the ethnic political party, political party and NLD are the are the same. So they want to work, uh, they want to cooperate, they want to work together. So I think if, if, I don't think democratic you know, waning, democratic spread is waning. I think uh, the actually the people, some um, people, the majority of maybe uh, the, the ethnic minority group maybe uh, maybe saying that. Uh, so only only the bombing majority, majority is uh, because of the majority rule. So we we okay. uh, energy one or something like that. But actually, the people can express their desire for democratization. That's why I don't think.
the, the democratic spirit is waning. May, I think that the democratic spirit is actually increasing. So we are actually thinking about long term. Okay, uh, thank you, okay, thank you. Uh, Klein, uh, to hear that uh, democratic spread is, is not waning at all. Actually, it has been more strengthened. And, you know, I collected uh, four excellent questions. I think I kind of already uh, alluded to these questions. So let me pose um, three questions to, to Kosai and Richard and Mo. Um, I guess, uh, as uh, Kai Min has alluded uh, briefly, uh, some participant raises issue of integrity of election, criticizing the uh, you uh, the union election committee, uh, saying that it is biased. So we need to change the procedure of uh, uh, you know setting up and reforming UEC. So maybe if uh, Kosai can answer this question will be good. And then uh, second question, uh, I think maybe to Richard, um, that's about this ethnic minority. And, and the one of the participant uh, has uh, uh, emphasized that the NLD won many seats in ethnic states like the Chin, Kachin and Kain states. So that doesn't mean that, that it uh, NLD support, uh, secured the support from ethnic minorities. So therefore this election, uh, uh, did it empower the ethnic minority or not? So if Richard can um, answer this one, that would be nice. And to the uh, third questions to more, um, and the reminding the Barack Obama's mentioning in 2012, when he visited the Yangon University, saying the Myanmar's geopolitical significance. So therefore, with this popular uh, mandate, would NLD uh, can exercise a more uh, stronger um, foreign policy, like uh, uh, to attending ISAB or the striking big FTAs, and also or they're strengthening their position uh, in this uh, delicate China-India relations. Uh, so it's a question of a foreign policy. So let's uh, start with the COSI about this independence of this uh, commission. Sure. Uh, I mean, the, these electoral legal frameworks uh, was initiated and approved in 2008. With, with, along with 2008, it's, it means that it's USG, SBDC, a former SBDC has been, has, has, was, was the one who formulated this electoral law. So the law was not, the law is, was not meant to move forward with democratic process. The law is just a kind of moving from SBDC to some kind of, of semi civilian government. It's kind of transitional document from one regime to another regime. So it's, it's very centralized, even though it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean to, it was not meant to control the result, but it meant to control the process. That's why the way the, the election commission appointed was very centralized, the president nominate, and then the parliament need to approve. So it was not impossible to parliament to reject the president nomination. So that was the case. But in the last five years, NRD has been facing this issue before 2014. NRD was the one who criticized a lot about this, the previous Union Election Commission. But during the last five years, NRD doesn't touch anything on that. And no political body touched on this issue. That's why we faced this issue in 2019 and 2020. That's, that was the case. So I think that it is not, I mean, majority of the people were saying that the personality of the UEC members uh, was the case. I don't think it is the personality can be changed easily, but the thing is a legal framework. So definitely we need to find a way how to make sure the Union Election Commission's member of the Union, the Union Election Commission's are independent. There are two, two ways. One thing is you need to, we need to change the constitution. I'm not sure whether it is possible in the next four years or five years. That's something. But if we can't change the constitution, there are some mechanisms to make sure that the UEC are more independent and, and, and non-partisan. Something like the president can create a mechanisms 
to select, to collect the name for the nomination. And the president can, and the parliament of the president can create a mechanism to select from the nomination and making sure that the, the UEC is more independent. It's kind of, there are a lot of issues. I mean, like options, if we want to change, we just need a political will. We doesn't need, for the long run, definitely, we need a constitutional reform. But before that, there are so many options we can adopt to make sure that UEC are more independent and nonpartisan and more credible. Thank you. Richard, are you comfortable for this claim that the NLD got the mandate from ethnic minorities because they won in the ethnic states? But, you know, I read the, in Lakhine State, because Rohingya group was excluded from exercising their voting right, there is a rebel group is forming. Uh, so there'll be more uh, conflict with the ruling party and the military. So what's your assessment? I mean, I certainly, you know, wouldn't support this kind of uh, broad statement. I think the first thing to keep in mind is that it's not always useful I mean, we, we, sometimes we have to use this term ethnic minorities, um, but it's actually not often, often it's not a very useful term because I mean, that's, it's a, it's, that's a extremely diverse group of uh, containing different interests, different um, traditions, cultures, uh, and, and so also different allegiances, right? I mean, there's some ethnic groups, if you consider, for example, the Lisu, who are traditionally more allied to um, the USDP because of grievances they have with another ethnic minority. Um, and uh, you have um, you have some, uh, I, I think most, most other ethnic minorities who, who strive for sort of um, their own uh, political parties. But, you know, and we've been sort of through this, uh, it's not a unitary category even within a large ethnic group. So sometimes you have multiple parties that try and win the votes of the same group and then you, you have uh, vote splits occurring, which in the first past the post system gives the advantage uh, to the NLD. And I mean, this is very drastic the way the NLD wins seats because in some regional parliaments, some of the ethnic political parties can't even win any uh, number of significant seats to make any changes. And this is also, you know, it's, it's kind of partly due to the NLD having um, pursued a really predatory approach to how they campaigned in ethnic minority areas. We have to understand that, you know, tr like historically, there's strong alliances between major ethnic parties such as the SNLD and the NLD, right? And um, these alliances were broken just before uh, the last election. And so far, they have not been uh, taken up again, and which means that the NLD campaigns in all the districts, sends out candidates in areas where where parties contest that look for their own representation and uh, that were partners of the NLD before. And so that's, that's a shift that the party has undergone. And this is something you bring up, Rakhine State, that it, at times this approach is, is deeply troubling um, because, of course, uh, you, you know, everyone would be aware that uh, the the the, uh, the sort of region government is uh, appointed uh, by the majority winner of the election by the by the union government, and so if you take the case of Rakhine, this is the same in in 2015, where um, you had the party, uh, the ANP, get a sizable number of votes, but can't get it into into uh, into government. Uh, then you have a huge amount of voters who feel disenfranchised. And um, the same thing, I think, we'll, we will be seeing uh, uh, now uh, again. And so I think uh, it's, it's I, don't, I, I wouldn't go as far as making this sort of general statement saying that the, the electoral districts that the NLD does win in ethnic minority areas constitute any form of broader support. Okay, thank you, Richard. Mo, what's the foreign policy implications from this election? Well, usually foreign policy doesn't feature much in uh, election platforms, but I did notice that 
uh, when the National League for Democracy, when the NLD was uh, putting out um, the, the progress uh, that had been uh, achieved or accomplished over its term from 2016 to 2020, they also included a report from, uh, on external relations. So I think going forward, uh, looking at uh, the, the, the strong mandate that the NLD has, um, you know, one of the one of the more pressing concerns that the, the government will need to address now will be twofold. One is uh, addressing that economic and social fallout from COVID-19, which, of course, many governments across the world now have as the top of their governance responsibility, but also uh, again, dealing with uh, the, the uh, engaging with, uh, you know, the international community on um, the topic that Myanmar is currently under scrutiny for uh, with relation to uh, the treatment of uh, what happened in uh, Rakhine over the Rohingya communities in uh, 2017. So, so all of these, of course, will now be refracted through the lens of foreign policy. And I would see, or I would look at maybe going forward, foreign policy would take on more of the economic diplomacy uh, aspect in, in the sense that Myanmar, of course, now is a, is a signatory to the Regional Comprehensive uh, Economic Partnership, which is which actually was um, mooted by ASEAN in 2012 as a kind of a delicate balance also between um, the, the interests, say, from China, uh, for example, and also uh, the global power rivalry. So, so ASEAN always tries to uh, bring together this constructive platform where uh, all the partners can try to uh, engage uh, constructively. And the RCEP, uh, which is ASEAN-led, is one of those platforms. So Myanmar, being an ASEAN member, has been a negotiating party of the RCEP uh, since, um, since it started, since the discussion started in uh, 2012. And, uh, you know, uh, Myanmar is also, as a member of ASEAN, um, party to the ASEAN uh, Korea Free Trade Agreement, for example, and several other uh, free trade agreements that ASEAN has negotiated as, as an organization, as a regional uh, body with uh, several dialogue partners. So what I'm saying is all of these have uh, the multilateral dimension. They are based on uh, established and agreed uh, you know, international rules such as the WTO. So I think Myanmar uh, of course, will be, I, I think, in a position to, to leverage on uh, these uh, different platforms to, to boost up that economic uh, performance legitimacy as well as to, to, uh, uh, to address the, the socioeconomic fallout from COVID-19. Um, but of course, you see, when we talk about the RCEP now being adopted, that's uh, the step one. Step two is getting it um, ratified. And for that, all of the governments uh, who have signed this uh, agreement will have to go back to their national legislature and get it ratified. And that's where the domestic consultation processes uh, will start and should start in order to explain to the different communities, you know, the business community, the investors, but also um, all the uh, communities in Myanmar, the populations who will be affected by one way or another from uh, the implementation of these uh, uh, agreements uh, that, you know, what is in it for them and how, how this will um, uh, impact them and so on. So, uh, you know, it, like I said, step two means the national uh, implementation part comes in. And I think that is where the, the link between Myanmar's international and regional alignments and the national priorities uh, will need to be uh, become in sync. Thank you, Mo. Okay, great uh, discussion. Let's move to the second round of discussion. Uh, that's more, you know, the prospect of a long-term um, road to democratizations. Uh, many people, especially from the West, is saying Myanmar has been stalled in the process of democratic tra transitions uh, and uh, it became, it's became it's stuck there, not moving to the next stage of more consolidations. Um, then for that kind of uh, consolidations happens, what kind of civil military re relations have to be there? And then uh, how the 
the people in Myanmar uh, is ready to go for the further, more consolidated, full uh, democracy. So let's start uh, uh, with the COSI first. Thanks, thanks for the question. This is a great question and a big question too. <laughs> uh, I, I, I will rather go from the people perspective. So we've been conducting a survey since 2015, before the election. So trying to test, we just borrow some questionnaires from the Asia Barometers, questionnaires from the World Value Surveys, to so trying to test like, what is the uh, citizen attitudes to what democracies, human rights, and democratic process and good governance or whatever. Uh, we're just trying to understand the people perception and then how us as a civil society can engage to improve uh, the perception of the people commitment to democracy so the data i mean like the the asia barometers asia foundation and and then a lot of surveys show that our people are committed to democracy that's for clear so it's been proved that in 1990 elections it's been proved that in 2012 by election in 2015 and now it's already proved that the people are, are committed to, to the part. The only thing is how the people can cr and engage and to promote that. That's, that's a very difficult part. And that's a thing, something I think that, that the NLD government needs to commit it to. Because for, from us a civil society member and as a member of the perspective from the civil society, as the role of civil society is a very crucial to move forward to create a space for the people to participate in this democratic, which is crucial and this is very foundation to move forward to be more democratic society. So I think that for the last five years, when, you, when we look at it, the indicator from Freedom House, indicator from Free, Free, Free Press, that the indicators are declining because, because of the, 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 the regulations regarding the free speech, free freedom of associations, the, the role of civil society has been, I have to say shrinking and declining. That's the dangerous for father democratic uh, uh, process. We are, we, we are just, just, just the, 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 the very first, the very beginning of the journey towards democracy. The militaries are staying there. A lot of people has been disenfranchised to participate, not necessarily, I mean like, I, I citizenship, but also other uh, legal framework and other processes. We have a lot of migrant workers who are not able to participate, even though they are citizens, they are the citizens in Thailand. There are many thousands, millions of people has ne never participated in the election and in Malaysia. I mean, a lot of people. So I mean, like, so, it's, so, so I think that for me, uh, if we want to move further, uh, energy government need to, instead of inviting, so need to open up for the citizen or for the civil society to participate in the process and open up for the media to be independent media, to, to commit it to the democratic process. That's, I think, crucial and fundamental to move forward for me from, I mean, as a civil society member, I would rather press on that approach. Yeah, I think it'll be more sensible with this popular mandate. NLD uh, should feel very confident to open up more, but uh, I don't know because they maybe still worry about their relations with the military. Uh, maybe that part you can address later. Uh, Richard, uh, you know the country well, and you also know the you know criticism primarily from the from the Western society focusing on Rohingya issues. Do you think uh, the West uh, is a uh, little bit biased, emphasizing too much about this uh, minority issues, rather than looking at the overall achievement of uh, NLD for uh, these ongoing democratic uh, transitions? Hmm. I mean, first of all, I mean, I would say that in, in my perception of this, I, I don't see so strictly a divide between uh, people from, say, Europe and the US and people in Myanmar. Um, in general, I'd say it's a divide between uh, people whose job it is to 
uh, do research or to focus on on um, on sort of policy issues and people who, who do not do that who are ordinary uh, citizens or have some other um, kind of profession because I would say that you know um, many many of the, the researchers are civil society actors and to some extent people working in politics that I do meet in Myanmar share uh, a grievance over the way uh, the Rohingya crisis unfolded. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think what sometimes does get lost in the West is, um, the, the, you know, there was this, there was a series of newspaper sort of headlines and saying, well, you know, now the NLD is sort of cozying up to the Tatmadaw and uh, they are now sort of best buddies and sort of have a very cooperative partnership because of, you know, Rakhine. Uh, because the West sort of people in, in Europe, when they see that, that Aung San Suu Kyi goes to The Hague to make the case to defend Myanmar, they think, well, you know, this must be, must be very pleasing to, to people in the armed forces. And, and you know, so, certainly I think it doesn't harm uh, the relationship, but it goes missing that within Myanmar, uh, and certainly from media that is uh, military affiliated, um, the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi are still being depicted as sort of uh, being too close with the, the Muslim population. And there's, there's sometimes a sentiment that the, the stance of the NLD on the Rohingya is not strict enough even, right? And so there's not necessarily the alliances that I think sometimes are perceived. Um, but in the future, you know, of course, you know, when we're looking at the question of um, the sort of democratic challenges and democratization in Myanmar, it has to be said that the protection of, of, of the most essential values of democracy, right? And these are the essential sort of uh, human rights, right? Freedom of movement, freedom of speech, you know, um, freedom to participate in elections, right? These need to be protected. There needs to be, I mean, we cannot have, uh, you cannot have a government uh, that doesn't protect these things and expect that at the same time you have uh, somehow a democratic uh, process, right? You might have structural improvements, but I think in the long term uh, that will be very difficult. And I think, you know, sort of you, there was a question coming through a little bit and sort of, you know, what, how, why is the NLD doing what it's, what it's doing and how it's been acting? And I, you know, from, you know, I've talked with, uh, with many, 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 many uh, uh, NLD politicians uh, over the years and there is a perception within the party that the party is aware of acting at times undemocratic, of, of defending, right? Like when I, when, you know, when the party like, decided not to repeal Article 66D of the telecommunications law, that is a, a way of, of repressing uh, criticism, uh, you know, there's an awareness within the NLD that this is not completely in line with a democratic uh, policy platform, but the justification is to say, well, while Myanmar is not entirely democratic, we can't afford to be entirely democratic either. Um, because we can't, we, we, we need have actually like sort of more control simply because we have to navigate as, uh, an environment where we, uh, where it's not complete democracy, where the military still plays an important role. But I think, you know, looking forward, that's one of the things that will have to, to change because I think that that's a really dangerous um, approach to, to kind of, if you delay um, your advocacy for, for democratic values and you delay uh, democratic uh, decisions or democratic policies, um, then uh, what you're inevitably doing to some extent is that you're more strongly consolidating, um, you know, whatever way you do behave. And if that's an autocratic, more autocratic way, or if it's more authoritarian uh, decision, you know, like the NLD uh, took out the section on protecting um, media freedom and freedom of speech from its election manifesto now for this, for this election. I mean, these are the kind of developments uh, that will have to be reversed and we will have to get back to sort of an open advocacy of the ruling party for democ uh, democracy and democratic values if we're to see more democratization. Yeah, I cannot agree more because South Korea was under the long authoritarian period 
and this ruling block, block usually find the reason to delay democratizations. So I think uh, I, I always compare Myanmar to uh, the 70s and uh, 80s of South Korea. <laughs> okay, Mo, what's your opinion? <laughs> You know, at one point in time, I was also looking at South Korea's democratization model to see how that could um, have some um, some resonance in Myanmar's own experience. Um, but okay, um, we're talking about Myanmar today. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, what, uh, what Gosai and Richard have highlighted, I think, really points to this, um, to this importance of looking at um, democracy and you know the, the transition to democracy the democratization and all the elements or the qualities of it right so yes elections are one part and you know, the right to vote and stand in elections yes that's one key element of democracy but so do uh, those uh, freedoms that uh, Richard has talked about and um, and also the respect for the rule of law so when we come to that respect for the rule of law right this is where I, I start thinking we need a new roadmap of our own creation. And why I say this is because, you know, people who are familiar with Myanmar's uh, recent political history will know that the current democratization process that we have is not one that was imagined by the people. It was something that was willed into reality by the military government. I said this at a panel yesterday as well. So we are living with this, uh, something that was uh, willed on us, this democratization process that was, imagined and uh, conceptualized and somehow uh, you know laid out in a roadmap a so-called seven step roadmap by the military and if and you know if you look at it right um we are still in that final step of that roadmap of trying to construct uh, a democratic union right so so i think uh as long as the 2008 constitution uh, goes on as it is. It is uh, it is a constraint, and it will continue to be a constraint, you know, uh, unless we we try to negotiate this uh, amendment. And uh, what Gosai said about uh, bringing in inputs from uh, a wider range of stakeholders is also very important because earlier on we were talking about how democracy promotion needs to be further entrenched beyond just you know uh, voting for or against based on uh, your own uh, you know emotive response to the process but really looking at that kind of you know deeper civic um, awareness and 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 that kind of um, uh, higher political awareness which go science surveys have been tracking so I, I think uh, that that is the next step going forward in terms of you know the discussions or the conversations on what democracy means for us we really need to do a lot more of that kind of civic um, advocate advocacy and the education you know I used to naively think that as long as there's this kind of established process to discuss all these um, amendments and so on you know, we could tackle that. But, you know, we've seen that process has run into roadblocks because um, either the military does not seem ready to relinquish the role and reach that it currently maintains in the country's political right, life, or, you know, um, how do they view their own uh, role? Uh, they've been preparing for so-called returning to the barracks uh, by, by preparing that uh, economically. But the withdrawal from political life, I think, has its own complexities, you know, uh, the 25 percent in parliament, the, the appointment of three ministerial portfolios and so on. So I, I think when we start discussing among all the stakeholders, I think, you know, one of the important stakeholders is also the military. You know, if they're part of the problem, they, they have to be part of the solution uh, simplistically. But uh, those crucial conversations taking place need to take place across that wide range when we talk about, you know, entrenching those values of democracy and getting that wider understanding towards the, the enlightened self-interest. And if you look at it, um, you know, the International Institute for uh, Democracy and Electoral Assistance, International IDEA, they have this um, uh, Global Democracy Index. Uh, I looked at uh, Myanmar's position. Uh, it's uh, in the mid-range of democratic performance. So looking at that, of course, we can see where are the areas that uh, further need to be um, constructively dealt with. And uh, again, you know, uh, we're not that bad. If we look around in Southeast Asia, our neighboring countries and so on, uh, ASEAN, you know, Myanmar's democracy is 
not that bad in terms of voice and expression and freedom of choice. I mean, after all, look at the vote. We, we've showed that, you know, we want to vote in the government. We want to elect the government that we want to chart the future. But so now the question now is, how do we chart that future? And, and how do we then, you know, use our social collective action uh, to, to continue with those consultative and communal actions that are also very central uh, to democracy? So I think, you know, there's a lot to be done. But um, again, going back to what I talked about, responding to the economic and social fallout of COVID-19, if you look at what are the challenges of addressing or responding to COVID-19, you will see the same kind of topics come up when we talk about democracy. You know, there are questions of inclusion, there are questions of equality, there are questions of consultation, there are questions of going with evidence-based decisions. So I think these are important ingredients also for democracy. And uh, we need to have um, that kind of uh, more constructive dialogue and crucial conversations to, to find that common ground or mutual interest that you know, all of us can agree uh, to work on together. And, and you know, call me an idealist, call me a constructivist, but I do believe in, in, in the power of, of dialogue and uh, discussion. Okay, it's thank better you to yeah, it's better to be sitting uh, across them, uh, you know, sitting face to face uh, with them across the table than having them in the streets with guns. Thank you, <laughs> Kain. I guess uh, your institute and your uh, networks have studied a lot, and with the, under the local government setting, so there seems to be more cooperation between local government and civil society regionally. So uh, what your in the long-term prospect for uh, the more to, to the past to democracy. You, you need to unmute. Yeah, we are actually to consolidate, uh, consolidate democracy. We need to promote a civic engagement in, in every sphere of the society. I think that uh, it's very important, uh, participatory democracy, we, we can call it. So we, the, 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 and the government, they, they need to create or en enlarge the, these spaces. But uh, what actually we, we are also seeing, seeing uh, these spaces uh, at, the, at the local level, but you know, especially in Burman, Burman majority area, so actually, the, uh, that's why the, sometimes yeah, it's very difficult for us uh, to uh, to uh, to generalize uh, to generalize blanketly and say that our uh, civic spaces uh, shrink uh, the completely in in our country. So there are areas, especially especially I think that especially freedom of association, freedom of protest, uh, something like that, uh, especially in in Rakhine, Rakhine State. Rakhine State uh, internet, uh, in the internet service was disrupted, and then the, the, the student Rakhine Aragon student they protested and, and they, they were they were they were sent to prison. That kind of thing uh, should not have been, not should not have occurred. But at the same time, there there, there are there are areas there are areas where uh, civic engagement is enhanced, enhance, especially uh, especially at the, at the township level now. Uh, especially in in Burman majority you know, regions, region seven seven regions. So they are local people. They are actually working closely with the you know, members of parliament, members of parliament and township planning and implementation committee. So township plan, planning and implementation committees are they they are responsible for coordination and and implementing development development pro projects. So the MPs. Because they, they they want to get votes no, from from uh, from the, from the from their constituency, they have to listen to their listen to their voices. So now the local voices are heard and then taken into account in in, in uh, budget planning, no, budget planning and development development uh, process. But at the same time, I, I think that the more more deliberation, no, more institutional institutionalization of these spaces. It's very, very important, very crucial to democratization, okay, because because they, they usually these are uh, these civic engagement they are not up to now they have not been formalized, 
So it depends on it. It, it sometimes it depends on context or something like that. Yeah, personal personal context. So we do not uh, the energy government. They must uh, they should uh, they should formalize these uh, civic engagement civic space and then so consult more. You no, know, they should uh, conduct more consultation, especially in the ethnic area, because. Uh, the BRM project, Bell and Road uh, Initiative project, the big mega project. These projects can have huge uh, impact on, on, the on the local community. Even now, the, the, the ethnic people, they feel excluded. Uh, they, 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 they think that uh, their voices are not heard with respect to these mega projects. So I think mechanism and the spaces should be created to listen to their voices. Otherwise, uh, they, don't have, they don't have outlets to not to bend their anger or to, to give them their grievances. I think that, 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 that kind of uh, mechanism is very crucial in, in the next time. In the Thank next you, Kain. I guess uh, I, I have only about uh, 10 minutes to uh, discuss. And I like this question. <laughs> and uh, Ye Aung has asked, even before we are discussing how we move to full-fledged, full democracy, we have to discuss the current quality of Myanmar democracy. And uh, he or she is asking, uh, Myanmar getting closer to liberal democracy or mob democracy, more populist democracy, I would say. Uh, if I add, you know, um, you uh, have a, a kind of problem in, in this uh, Mabata movement and very aggressive, uh, the nationalistic uh, Buddhism and that kind of things um, obviously is not close to the, the vision of liberal democracy. Uh, so I wonder, uh, forget about the minority issues. So if you just focus on the mainstream, uh, how, you assess the current quality of a democracy, uh, uh, you know, looking at this um, very nationalistic Buddhism and, and that kind of, uh, that kind of mood uh, that is critical to the quality of a democracy in your country. So let's just start from Kosai and maybe you can speak just two minutes each. I for me, we are far away to live as a democracy. We are just stay on the path. We are just started exercising election. Election doesn't mean democracy, I mean. Definitely democracy, every democracy has the election as a mean to elect the government. But once we have the election and we can't live it, just simply live it, and then oh, we got democracy. I don't think it is a, the right way to term our political system yet. So we are staying very far away. I mean, we are just started the beginning. As, as Mamu just mentioned that, this is the, the, the current framework is not from the people. It is not, we are not, we, we haven't owned this process yet. So we need to own this process and then we can move forward. I, 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 I think that it, it's stay far away uh, to, 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 I mean, assess the quality of the, of, of the, of, of the democracy. Yeah, I mean, it's stay too early. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, you know, I agree with uh, with Kosai. Um, you know, today I would characterize or describe Myanmar as a, as a hybrid regime, and it has parts of that are that are authoritarian. And it has parts that are legitimately democratic, and it's the question: what you do with this? We there used to be this understanding that once you embark on a democratization process, somehow it just unfolds, and you have a sort of you automatically kind of come to a consolidation stage. Um, we don't think like that anymore today, and, and everyone knows that it's tough and it's not a sort of process where you know in what direction it's going to go. Um, but one thing I would like to highlight is that, you know, maybe for the first time in, a, you know, in many decades, I think what this election has also shown is that the current state of affairs in Myanmar is fairly stable. Whatever powers the civilian power does have, they're fairly stable. Whatever control the military has, it's fairly stable. And let's not forget that for all the criticism that is there, and it's rightly, is, 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 is right, but that the civilian government will again have a majority in both houses 
any change that doesn't require constitutional amendment can be made. And within that, there is an, a great potential for making democratic progress and for making democratic policy. And I think so looking in the future, while it's understandable that everyone wants progress on the big things, on constitutional amendment, on national reconciliation and peace, I think, um, you know, as said before, the military is not going to give up its power, uh, you know, in the next five years. But if the civilian government focuses on all these possibilities that it has just by having the majority, and this could be anything, judiciary reform, you know, rule of law, uh, you know, strengthening democratic principles, we talked about that, all of these things are technically possible. And that's also, I think, something I'd like to highlight. Okay, well, um, I think somebody asked uh, new questions about whether the Myanmar has the freedom of speech <laughs> enough. <laughs> so what's your reaction? Um, yeah, uh, I think, you know, it, it's true. We, we are probably uh, hearing more criticisms because there is less uh, silencing of voices. And I think that's a plus point. I mean, you know, what we see in democratic systems really is a constant kind of pushing the envelope. And then, and it's, it's, it's a continuous kind of uh, effort to not, not just like build the democracy, but once uh, you believe that you have uh, achieved some level of stability and, and the fundamentals of a democratic system, you continue building it, nurturing it, trying to improve it. So it's really uh, of a continuous nature. And, and I think um, that is what we are seeing now. People's voices can't really be silenced. I think once the previous administration before the NLD, the US DB government suddenly let go of most of those uh, restrictions on the internet, on um, uh, censorship of the press and so on. Once you've kind of like let that out, you can't really raid it all back in again. So then it would be how, how these conversations are continued. And I use that term crucial conversation in the sense that these are conversations you need to have at different levels among different communities such that they provide that feedback um, to, to the executive, to the legislature uh, for, for that continuous improvement. So I think um, I would, because I always try to see things from that constructive viewpoint, uh, I, I see this as, as uh, essential and as Gosai and Richard have also highlighted, the freedom of expression uh, along with freedom of worship, freedom of assembly and all of that, they are uh, essential characteristics also of democracy that we, we also need to continuously, you know, build and improve. I was just uh, thinking about that uh, continuous building and improving uh, nature of, of democracy, you know, um, democracy and uh, part of that democracy, which are the electoral processes, they are not perfect. They are, they are imperfections in the system. And these imperfections for me show where we need to uh, focus on for continual improvement to reach that, that inclusive status that Gosai mentioned much earlier uh, in, the, in the program and also improve the quality of uh, uh, a democracy, which, you know, the country has to own, the citizens and the leadership have to own and lead, uh, own and lead that. Um, and, you know, I was just sharing this point also yesterday, um, Burma, still as a co colony of the British, you know, as a British colony, in 1935, granted the vote to women, and it was, I think, the first country in Asia to, to give women the vote. And if you do that comparative thing, Women in the United States had gained the vote in 1920, and women in the in in, in the United Kingdom, uh, Burma's colonial master at the time, had gained the vote in 1918, but only after how many centuries of asking for that vote? And if you look at the United States, African American men in the United States gained the right to vote in 1870, which was almost nearly a century after the United States became an independent sovereign state. And of course, the news that we see and hear in the present moment, of course, you know, reminds us of the imperfections in systems and practices and the continuous need to improve. So I'd just like to make that point again. You know, it, it is, I think, that continuous need to improve that 
Myanmar needs to bear in mind when it continues with that transition. And that need to improve requires inputs from all of us who have a stake in our country's political future. Thank you. Two minutes to kind. Yeah, I agree with uh, Mamu. It's, it's a continuous process. Uh, Myanmar needs to improve its uh, democratization. Uh, uh, in my opinion, with respect to democratic governance, there have been progress in some, some area. Uh, for example, budget transparency in the past, we, could, uh, we, 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 cannot, uh, we cannot see the details of the budget. Now, uh, budget uh, uh, transparency, they, it has not been up to international standard, so needs to be improved. But now, for example, budget transparency and policy, policy not policy areas. So government they have to be accountable. Now they have to be accountable to uh, to 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 the to, to the policy con constituents. So it, that's that's why I think it's a it's a kind of struggle. So there, 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 there are areas which need to be in, improved uh, substantially, but also there, there, are, there are areas uh, which have, uh, which have all, already improved a, a lot, something like that. So I think uh, it, it will be democratization and democratic uh, promotion of democratic governance. It will be a interesting, very interesting subject for, you know, for, for all of us in, in, in Myanmar. We have to we have to continue to monitor uh, monitor uh, 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 whether 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 whether, whether and the government and the party is ruling or other party is ruling ruling the country. So we we have to get in touch with these you now with, with these issues and people. The public must have access to you know, information. That's that's very important. Uh, access to information. That's why that we are also encouraging and pushing the government to be more transparent. No? So uh, let the let the public get access to to public information. So I think uh, it will it, it will be very challenging for the for the government as well as for for civil society and the public in in the in the near and then medium term and long term. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was fascinating discussions. You know, uh, my key takeaways from uh, four distinguished panelists is that number one. Um, all of you seem to agree that the, uh, despite some problem like uh, canceling uh, voting in Lacan state and also some problem about the electoral commission, I think all seem to agree that the, uh, the, this election uh, was fair and, and, and you believe that there's integrity of elect, uh, election process. Uh, but number two, but nevertheless, many, uh, all of you have pointed out, you need to, Myanmar still needs a lot to reform uh, bec uh, bec to make a, a system more inclusive, to enfranchise the minority groups, uh, and also changing the election rule more to proportional maybe rather than simple first past post system. Uh, and number three, and, and you believe uh, the majority of uh, uh, the Myanmar people are very much committed to democracy. Uh, so there are much space and energy uh, to reform to the future, uh, to the stable past to further democratization, uh, even though the current big picture was uh, imposed from the top. Uh, so. Uh, my wish is that all this uh, popular mandate uh, of uh, NLD from the last election, uh, they can, you know, go for more positively and, and confidently uh, to go, uh, you know, to the step by step toward uh, full democracy. Uh, thank you so much, uh, participants from Myanmar and also uh, Hamburg, Germany and Singapore and also Seoul, Korea. It was a fascinating talk and I wish you all the best and thank you for the participants for raising very uh, important questions. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.